world of serial killers has long captivated the morbid fascination of both true crime enthusiasts and psychologists seeking to understand the darkest corners of the human mind. And among the most chilling and enigmatic cases are those that led notorious murderers to psychiatric hospitals. These individuals, driven by incomprehensible motives and heinous desires, committed unimaginable acts of violence. From the classic monsters of the past to the more recent cases that shook society, here are nine serial killers who went to psychiatric hospitals. Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper, was one of the most notorious serial killers in British history. He was convicted of murdering 13 women and attempting to murder seven others between 1975 and 1980. He mainly targeted prostitutes and women in red light districts, claiming that he was on a mission from God to rid the world of them. Thankfully, he was finally arrested in 1981 after a massive manhunt that involved thousands of police officers and millions of pounds. Sutcliffe was born in 1946 in Bingley, West Riding of Yorkshire. England. Unfortunately, he had a troubled childhood. He was bullied at school and suffered child abuse from his dad, who once smashed a glass of beer on his head when he was five. He then left school at 15 and worked menial jobs, which included working as a grave digger and a lorry driver. This was before he married Sonia Sutcliffe in 1974, but their marriage was unhappy as he had affairs with prostitutes. Sutcliffe's life of crime began with his first known victim, Wilma McCann, a 28-year-old mother of four, who he killed in October 1975 in Leeds. He hit her with a hammer and stabbed her 15 times. This was after he had already assaulted four different women on different occasions. He then went on to kill 12 more women and injure seven more in Yorkshire and Manchester over the next five years. Sutcliffe used various weapons such as knives, screwdrivers, hammers and axes to attack his victims. He also often mutilated their bodies, especially their genitals, which earned him the nickname of the Yorkshire Ripper as an allusion to Jack the Ripper. Although Sutcliffe was interviewed by the police nine times during the investigation, he managed to evade suspicion he also received hoax letters and tapes from someone claiming to be the Ripper, which misled the police and diverted their attention from him. Sutcliffe was finally caught in January 1981 when he was stopped by the police in Sheffield for driving with false number plates. He confessed to being the Ripper after being transferred to West Yorkshire Police. His motive for the killings was also very shocking, as Sutcliffe claimed he heard voices from God telling him to kill prostitutes. For this reason, he pleaded not guilty to murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility, but he was found guilty by a majority verdict and sentenced to 20 concurrent life sentences. Sutcliffe spent three decades at Broadmoor Hospital, a high-security psychiatric facility, where he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He then changed his name to Peter Coonan, his mother's maiden name, and divorced his wife in 1994. In 2010, his sentence was changed to a whole life order, meaning that he would never be released. And then, in 2016, he was moved to HMP Franklin, a maximum security prison in County Durham. Sutcliffe died on the 13th of November, 2020, at the age of 74. He had various health problems, such as diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. He also contracted COVID-19 but refused treatment for it. Next on the list is Daniel Gonzalez. David Gonzalez was a British spree killer who killed four people and wounded two others in a drug-fueled rampage across London and Sussex in 2004. Interestingly, he was obsessed with horror films and wished to become a famous serial killer like Freddy Krueger, the fictional character from A Nightmare on Elm Street. Gonzalez had a history of mental health problems and drug abuse. He was diagnosed with psychological problems and treated by specialist teams. Gonzalez spent his time playing video games and watching horror films, especially those featuring serial killers. He idolized Freddy Krueger and even went as far as writing letters to himself as Zippy, his childhood nickname, where he described his fantasies of killing people and how much he enjoyed it. In September 2004, Gonzalez embarked on a stabbing spree that lasted two days. He armed himself with knives and wore a hockey mask similar to the one worn by Jason Voorhees, another horror film villain from Friday the 13th. His usual targets were elderly and vulnerable people, mostly at random, in London and Sussex. His first victim was Marie Harding, a 76-year-old woman who he stabbed to death in Hove while wearing the mask. He then returned to his home in Woking and wrote a letter to himself saying how much he enjoyed the murder and how he felt like Freddy Krueger. Two days later, he attacked four more people in Tottenham and Highgate. He killed Kevin Malloy, a 46-year-old man who he stabbed in the face, neck, and torso. Derek Robinson, a 75-year-old man who he stabbed in his home. And Jean Robinson, Derek's 68-year-old wife who he stabbed as she tried to escape. He also wounded Kumis Constantino, a 59-year-old man who fought him off after he broke into his house. Gonzalez was arrested later that day after he was spotted by a decorator who witnessed him dashing unclothed and drenched in blood from the Robinson's residence. He was then charged with four counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder. During the trial, Gonzalez attempted to assert his innocence by reason of insanity, but the plea was ultimately dismissed. As a consequence, he received six life sentences, and the presiding judge strongly recommended that he should never be granted parole. Gonzalez, however, had a suicidal instinct which was 
noticed subtly only by his mother when she sought mental help for him. Before the trial, when he was detained at Broadmoor Hospital in Berkshire, Gonzalez attempted to commit suicide by biting through an artery in his arm and exhibited such extreme violence that officers in riot gear were required to accompany him at all times. Gonzalez died in 2007 at the age of 27 while serving his sentence at Broadmoor Hospital. He committed suicide by cutting his wrists with a broken CD case. Ed Kemper, also known as the co-ed killer, was an American serial killer who killed 10 people between 1964 and 1973. He was notorious for his brutality, necrophilia, and cannibalism. And yes, he had a domineering height of 6 feet 9 inches. Kemper was born in Burbank, California on December 18, 1948. He had a dysfunctional family with an abusive mother and an absent father. He also showed signs of psychopathy from an early age, such as torturing animals, playing with severed dolls' heads, and having violent fantasies. He also had a fascination with horror films and serial killers. Kemper's criminal record began at the age of 15 when he shot and killed both his grandparents. Seemingly without any clear motive, he shot his grandmother in the head and reportedly stabbed her. Repeatedly, then shot his grandfather when he came home. He then called his mother and confessed to the murders when he became unsure of what to do next. Kemper was then arrested and deemed mentally unstable and was subsequently sent to the Atascadero State Hospital, a psychiatric institution. This was after the court psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia. He spent five years in the hospital where he befriended his psychiatrists and even learned how to manipulate them. In fact, Kemper scored an astonishing 145 when he underwent an IQ test at the hospital. This and more convinced his caregivers that he was cured and was eventually released at the age of 21. He moved in with his mother in Santa Cruz, California, where he attended community college and worked odd jobs before committing a series of more horrifying murders. Kemper's time in Atascadero State Hospital also aided his next batch of crimes, as he later revealed. His understanding of how psychiatric tests operated provided him with the ability to manipulate his psychiatrists effectively. He also openly admitted that during his time administering tests to sex offenders, he gained valuable insights and knowledge that he later used to his advantage. With his newfound freedom, Kemper brutally murdered eight people, including six young female hitchhikers, his own mother, and her best friend. His modus operandi was to pick up his victims while cruising around in his car, making them believe he was a harmless, chatty driver. He would then drive them to isolated places where he strangled or shot them. Next, he took their corpses to his apartment or his mother's house, where he would perform sexual acts on them before going on to dismember them. The turning point in Kemper's crime spree came on April 20th, 1973, when he murdered his mother, Clarnell, while she slept. After killing her, he beheaded her and engaged in various acts of mutilation with her body. For him, killing her was a gruesome and symbolic act that represented his deep-seated rage towards his domineering mother over the years. Following his mother's murder, Kemper called his mother's close friend, 59-year-old Sarah Taylor, Sally Hallett. He invited her to come over for dinner and a movie. However, once Hallett arrived, Kemper mercilessly strangled her to death. He intended to fabricate a false story that his mother and Hallett had gone away on vacation together. Afterward, Kemper called the police and confessed to his crimes, which led to his arrest, and he cooperated fully with law enforcement. During his confession, he displayed a chilling lack of remorse, recounting the details of each murder with horrifying clarity. In November 1973, Kemper was convicted of eight counts of first-degree murder. His defense team argued for an insanity plea, given his history of mental health issues and time spent in a psychiatric hospital. However, the jury found him guilty. Kemper once again shocked many by making an unusual request for the death penalty, specifically asking for death by torture. However, due to a moratorium imposed on capital punishment by the Supreme Court of California, his request could not be granted. This led to a sentence of seven years to life in prison in the California Medical Facility. Throughout his time in prison, Kemper became known for his intelligence and was often cooperative with prison staff and psychologists. He even participated in several interviews, providing insights into his disturbed mind and explaining his actions. Russell Johnson, better known by his infamous alias, the Bedroom Strangler, was a Canadian serial killer and rapist, responsible for the horrific crimes of raping and murdering multiple women in London and Guelph during the 1970s. Johnson's killing spree began in October 1973 when he strangled 20-year-old Mary Hicks in her London apartment. This continued for four haunting years, during which he ruthlessly raped and strangled no fewer than seven women within their apartments in the cities of London and Guelph. He operated by meticulously stalking his victims, biding his time until he believed they were asleep and vulnerable, and, to gain access to their apartments, he fearlessly scaled the exterior walls, sometimes climbing buildings as high as 15 stories. Once inside, he would pounce upon his unsuspecting victims, often silently observing them while they slept, before subjecting them to appalling sexual assaults and suffocation. He also sometimes mutilated their bodies or posed them after death. In addition to the murders, Johnson's reign of terror extended to the non-fatal assault of 11 other women within the same vicinity. Johnson was arrested in July 1977 and was charged
charged with the murder of three women. During the trial, Johnson asserted that he was plagued by an overwhelming and uncontrollable compulsion to commit acts of rape and murder. Initially, he entered a plea of not guilty for the three known killings, leaving the parties present perplexed. However, Johnson eventually confessed to four additional homicides and 11 non-fatal assaults. It was at this point that it became apparent to the court that Johnson's mental state was severely impaired as he demonstrated an inability to fully comprehend the gravity of his appalling crimes. This lack of understanding led the court to find him not guilty by reason of insanity. Nevertheless, Johnson was indefinitely sentenced to the Waypoint Center for Mental Health Care, a maximum security mental hospital where he would receive the necessary treatment and care while being kept away from society to prevent any further harm. As of 2012, the now 76-year-old convict has been on a prescription for Lupron, an anti-androgen drug known for its capacity to significantly decrease testosterone levels, thereby reducing his sex drive to a considerable extent. And despite his plea, the Ontario Court of Appeals firmly denied his request to be transferred to the Brockville Mental Health Center, a medium security psychiatric institution, Ed Gein. Edward Theodore Gein, famously known as the Butcher of Plainfield, was born on August 27, 1906, in La Crosse County, Wisconsin. Gein's formative years were fraught with hardship and dysfunction, grappling with the difficulties of having an alcoholic father who passed away in 1940, and enduring verbal abuse from his mother. But, in a shocking turn of events, he later came to idolize his mother. These challenging circumstances, however, set the stage for the disturbing events that would unfold later in his life. After the passing of his mother in 1945, Gein withdrew from society, becoming a reclusive figure. However, in 1957, police attention was drawn to him following the mysterious disappearance of Bernice Warden, the owner of a local hardware store. The suspicion arose when it was discovered that Gein had been seen with Warden shortly before she vanished without a trace. Growing concerns led law enforcement officials to conduct a thorough investigation on Gein's farm. Surprisingly, the lifeless and decapitated body of Bernice Warden was found within the confines of Ed Gein's property. Her corpse was found hanging from the rafters by her ankles. Closer observations revealed that she had died from a fatal gunshot wound. As if this was not enough, an assortment of dismembered body parts were also discovered in his house. Among them were the remains of Mary Hogan, a tavern keeper who had mysteriously vanished three years prior. Following his arrest, Gein openly confessed to the grisly murders of the two women whose lifeless bodies were discovered in his home, asserting that both bore an uncanny resemblance to his mother. He also confessed to the authorities about the origin of the majority of the body remains and his collection of macabre paraphernalia. Gein revealed that he had sourced these ghastly items from three nearby graveyards. He also confessed that he took care to only exhume those corpses that bore a striking resemblance to his beloved mother. But the fact remains that the true extent of Gein's crimes remained shrouded in mystery, as up to 40 bodies were discovered in his home before it was tragically consumed by a mysterious fire in 1958. However, despite his admission, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity when faced with the charges. Following this, a comprehensive evaluation in late 1957 supported his claim of mental unfitness to stand trial, as he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was then sent to the Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, which is now known as the Dodge Correctional Institution, a maximum security facility located in Waupun, Wisconsin. Subsequently, he was later transferred to the Mendota State Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin, where he would receive specialized psychiatric care and evaluation. After receiving treatment and rehabilitation, Gein was deemed mentally competent to face trial a decade later. In the end, he was convicted only for the murder of Bernice Warden amidst a series of alleged crimes that had initially brought him under suspicion. The courtroom's verdict was further complicated by the revelation of his disturbed mental state during the time of the offense, resulting in him never being convicted for the murder of Mary Hogan. As a consequence, he found himself once again confined to a mental hospital, where he spent the rest of his days until his eventual passing in 1984 at the age of 77. Next on the list of serial killers who went to psychiatric hospitals is Ian Brady, but his story will not be complete without the mention of Myra Hindley, and together they committed what has come to be known as the Moore's Murders. Hindley and Brady met in the early days of January 1961 when she was 18-year-old named. This was around the same time she began her employment at Millwoods as a typist, but little did she know that her life was about to take a dark turn. As the days passed, an inexplicable infatuation grew within her for a co-worker, Brady, even though she was aware of his troubling criminal record. Now let's go back a bit. Brady had a rough childhood and his life of crime started at a rather early age. While in high school, he appeared before a juvenile court twice for housebreaking, which caused him to leave the school at the age of 15. He was also placed on probation by the court shortly before his 17th birthday after he reportedly threatened his then-girlfriend with a flick knife with nine additional charges against him. On another occasion, Brady found himself in a precarious situation when he was apprehended with a sackful of stolen lead seals, which he was attempting to sneak out of the market. For this, he 
spent about three months in HM Prison Manchester, popularly known as Strange Ways. In addition to this, Brady also spent a few years in detention centres. Brady and Hindley operated around Manchester, England between July 1963 and October 1965. They were responsible for the tragic deaths of five children, whose ages ranged from 10 to 17, and at least four of these victims were subjected to sexual assault. They got most of their prey by offering them lifts and then deceiving them to Saddleworth Moor to search for an expensive, lost glove. By 1965, their malevolent acts escalated further, and they involved Hindley's brother-in-law, David Smith, in their twisted plans. They forced Smith to witness the murder of 17-year-old Edward Evans, who Brady killed with a hatchet blow to the head. Thankfully, Smith's conscience prevailed, and he bravely reported their heinous deeds to the police, putting an abrupt and decisive end to their deadly killing spree. Since the death penalty for murder had already been abolished during Brady and Hindley's time on remand, the judge had no choice but to impose the maximum sentence allowed by law, which was life in prison. Brady received three concurrent life sentences, while Hindley was handed two, alongside a concurrent seven-year term for knowingly harboring Brady, aware of his murderous actions towards Kilbride. Consequently, Brady was incarcerated at HM Prison Durham, while Hindley was sent to HM Prison Holloway to serve their respective sentences. Following his conviction, Brady requested to live in solitary confinement during his time in prison. For 19 long years, he resided within the confines of mainstream prisons. However, in November 1985, a pivotal diagnosis branded him as a psychopath, leading to his transfer to the high-security Park Lane Hospital, later known as Ashworth Hospital, situated in Maghull, Merseyside. Interestingly, Brady explicitly expressed his vehement opposition to the idea of ever being released, firmly desiring to remain confined for the rest of his life. Hindley, who was a chain smoker, died from bronchial pneumonia at West Suffolk Hospital in November 2002 at the age of 60. Brady, on the other hand, met his end at Ashworth Hospital in May 2017, succumbing to restrictive pulmonary disease at age 79. Graham Young, recognized as the teacup poisoner and the St. Albans poisoner, earned infamy as an English serial killer who employed poison as his lethal weapon to claim the lives of his victims. Having tragically lost his mother at a tender three months old, Young found himself under the care of his aunt and her husband during his formative years. Growing exceptionally close to them, those initial two years left a lasting impact on his young heart. However, in 1950, when his father remarried and reunited the family in St. Albans, Young displayed evident signs of distress at being separated from his beloved aunt. This emotional upheaval seemed to shape his personality as he grew into a rather peculiar child, choosing solitary habits and showing little interest in socializing with peers of his age. When it came to academics, Young's sole passions lay in chemistry, forensic science, and toxicology. And, due to the limited coverage of these subjects within the school curriculum, he took it upon himself to broaden his knowledge through extensive, extracurricular reading and self-driven study. In addition to his academic pursuits, Young held a peculiar fascination for sensationalist non-fiction narratives surrounding murders, with Dr. Crippen, the notorious poisoner, ranking among his particular favorites. And as he entered his teenage years, an alarming interest in Adolf Hitler began to take hold of him. Before long, Young embarked on a disturbing path, poisoning the food and beverages of his stepmother, dad, sister, and schoolmate. Unfortunately, his stepmother was not as lucky as his other victims who survived the poisoning. However, his malevolent activities were brought to an end when his teacher grew suspicious and promptly alerted the authorities, leading to his eventual capture in May 1962. He confessed to three counts of poisoning involving his father, sister, and school friend. And, though Young confessed to poisoning his stepmother when questioned by the police, he was not charged with her murder, as the autopsy report did not attribute her death to poisoning. So, at the tender age of 14, Young found himself committed to the confines of Broadmoor Maximum Security Hospital, making him the youngest inmate to be held there since 1885. The sentence imposed on him required a minimum of 15 years in confinement. Interestingly, shortly after he arrived at Broadmoor, John Berridge, a fellow inmate, lost his life due to cyanide poisoning. But despite suspicions arising among certain staff members and inmates regarding Young's possible involvement, concrete evidence was never established, and the death was officially deemed a suicide. In addition to this, there were several occasions where poisons and chemicals were discovered in staff and inmates' drinks. Although Young's fascination for poisons never dampened while he was incarcerated as he continued reading anything he could find on toxicology, he was released from Broadmoor in 1971 after eight years of detention. Following his release, Young secured a job at a factory in Bovingdon, Hertfordshire. It was here that the teacup poisoner continued his sinister deeds as he started poisoning his un suspecting colleagues. Tragically, this led to two fatalities and several others falling critically ill. Young was arrested again in 1972. He was convicted on two counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of administering poison. He was found guilty on all charges and four life sentences, which were to be served at Park Lane Hospital, now Ashworth Hospital, located in Maggle. During his stay at Ashworth, Young 
unexpectedly formed a friendship with none other than Moore's murderer, Ian Brady, and peculiarly, the two found a common fascination with Nazi Germany. He later served most of his sentence in HM Prison Parkhurst, where he ultimately passed away due to a heart attack in 1990, shortly before his 43rd birthday. Robert Maudsley, a British serial killer, bears the guilt of four gruesome murders. Shockingly, three of these heinous acts were committed within the confines of prison, despite already serving a life sentence for one murder. The gruesome nature of his crimes earned him the ominous moniker Hannibal the Cannibal among the British press, as he is alleged to have consumed part of the brain of one of the three men he killed while behind bars. Maudsley's first murder was in 1974, when he garroted John Farrell. Farrell, who had picked him up for sexual purposes, met his unexpected end after he showed Maudsley disturbing pictures of children he had sexually abused. Subsequently, he was apprehended and received a life sentence with a recommendation that he never be released. He was found unfit to stand trial and was then transferred to Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. While in prison, Maudsley and another inmate took a third patient, who happened to be a convicted pedophile hostage. They confined themselves in a cell with their captive and subjected him to unspeakable torture, ultimately leading to his death. When the guards eventually intervened, they found the victim's skull shattered, with a spoon embedded in his brain and parts missing. It was this incident that gave Maudsley his nickname, Hannibal the Cannibal, as it was speculated that he may have consumed part of his victim's brain. As a result of this act, Maudsley was convicted of manslaughter and immediately transferred to Wakefield Prison. Here, he committed two more murders, barely a year after the previous one. His first target was Salni Darwood, a sex offender. Having invited Darwood into his cell, Maudsley used a garrote and a knife before concealing the lifeless body beneath his bed. Following this grisly act, he attempted to entice other prisoners into his cell, but all wisely refused to take the bait. Unsatisfied, Maudsley continued his sinister hunt around the prison wing, searching for a second victim. Eventually, he found Bill Roberts, whom he cornered and viciously stabbed to death. He used a makeshift dagger to hack at Roberts' skull and repeatedly slammed his head against the walls. Upon witnessing the extreme danger posed by Maudsley, the authorities concluded that a conventional cell was inadequate to contain him. Consequently, they constructed a unique two-cell unit in the basement of Wakefield Prison, specifically designed to house him for the duration of his confinement in 1983. The cells are constructed with perspex, and the furniture is fashioned from cardboard. To this day, Maudsley remains in solitary confinement, with only one hour of daily exercise permitted outside his cell under the watchful eyes of at least four prison officers. In March 2000, Maudsley made an unsuccessful plea to have the terms of his solitary confinement eased or even to be granted permission to end his life using a cyanide capsule. Additionally, he sought the companionship of a pet budgerigar, but this request was also denied. Despite his appeals, the stringent measures of his confinement remained unyielding, leaving him isolated from the outside world. And last on the list is Richard Chase, Richard Trenton. Chase gained notoriety as the vampire killer of Sacramento due to his gruesome practices of consuming the blood of his victims and engaging in cannibalistic acts with their body parts. In 1973, Chase was briefly confined to a psychiatric ward for reasons linked to his disturbed behavior. However, in 1976, after injecting rabbit's blood into his veins, he was involuntarily committed to a mental institution. It took no time for the hospital staff to recognize his unexplainable fixation on blood, which also earned him the nickname Dracula. This was after the staff witnessed him snapping the necks of two birds he caught through the window of the hospital and consuming their blood. And it didn't end here. Chase also displayed a disturbing obsession with blood by extracting it from therapy dogs using stolen syringes. Following a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, Chase underwent an array of treatments involving psychotropic drugs. As a result of these interventions, authorities determined that he no longer posed a threat to society. Consequently, in 1976, he was released into the custody of his mother, as they believed he could be managed and supported in a non-institutional setting. But how wrong they were. Just about a year after his release, Chase was found in a field near Lake Tahoe, Nevada, completely unclothed and covered in the blood of a cow. The incident was promptly reported, but unfortunately, no significant action was taken. Barely a few months after this, Chase killed his first known victim in a drive-by shooting, and, in 1978, he committed his second murder, which involved a three-month pregnant Teresa Wallen, who he shot, before going on to sexually abuse her corpse and drink her blood. Initially, Chase managed to elude identification as the brutal killer, but, just four days later, Chase went on a murder spree. He broke into the home of Evelyn Miroth. He mercilessly shot 38-year-old Miroth, her six-year-old son Jason, and their family friend, Daniel Meredith. Evelyn's 22-month-old nephew, Michael Ferreira, also fell victim to his malevolence. The arrival of a visitor, however, distracted Chase. He then fled the house, but also abducted the lifeless body of young Michael Ferreira. The visitor wasted no time in alerting a neighbor, who then called the police. Chase was arrested shortly afterward, and a search of his apartment revealed every surface of his house, including his eating and drinking utensils, to be soaked in blood. In May 1979, Chase faced the grim consequences of his actions, as he was convicted on six 
six counts of first-degree murder. The court therefore sentenced him to be executed in the gas chamber after rejecting the plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. However, on December 26, 1980, Chase's lifeless body was found in his prison cell. He committed suicide through a fatal overdose of prescribed medications, thus bringing an end to the dark chapter of the Vampire Killer of Sacramento. Is there any one of these serial killers you think deserves more than a sentence to a psychiatric hospital? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. For more captivating videos like this, click on one of the cards currently displayed on your screen.